I've had uh, a lot of institutes since we last spoke, uh, and uh, some of them have been nearly empty. I taught an institute in Eitorf with one participant, Sebastian Alvarez, who came all the yeah. way from Norway. And uh, we actually, we had a very productive time. Uh, we... Uh, oh, is it Sebastian? He, he's from Sweden, I think. Sweden or Norway? So one in Denmark, Sweden. one of those. I, I always get Sweden. all those Scandinavian countries mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, when you when you have a chance to work with a little more intensity, then there's a chance to really uh, break through certain long-standing habits. And what I'm finding is that the uh, this arm weight technique uh, it manifests slightly differently in each person's experience. So. Um, Sometimes it'll come out as a physical injury. Sometimes it'll come out more like cer a certain sort of psychological trauma. Uh, so, and certain people respond more quickly to the idea that you can you can simply stand up. You don't have to feel. Of course, you can feel the weight of your arm, but you don't have to succumb to it. Like, oh, 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 oh. You can feel the weight and stand up. And then, from a point of unstable equilibrium do whatever you want and have a hand mechanism which is going to keep you in a state of unstable equilibrium. So there are a lot of new insights to that. So with Sebastian it was really, it was a lot of elasticity with, with, which I'm ta I've been talking about more and more lately. The fact that you can't just use the skeletal structure but the elastics, these, the flexors in here function el not only as a contractive movement generating action but as an elasticity generating action so that you don't have to regain your state of unstable equilibrium from one, one step to the next but something elastic carries you through each step on going to the next one and of course there's an always there's a sort of a, a spinning in the joints aspect to it you know you're elastic when you can feel things spinning it's not totally direct. I think this relates to uh, Leszczyzny's indirect attack approach, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of his his uh, approach to piano technique. So with so Sebastian, say, hmm? what? Uh, like when you when you look at Horowitz playing, he's like like a monolith playing, right? Would, that, you, would you say you would? Yeah. That's the external look. That's yeah. the external look. He's actually every joint in his body is in continuous movement. And it's so well balanced and it's so internalized that you don't see it. But the it's like a bird, you know, they do yeah. that with a hand, they move their butt, like a gimbal, yeah. like a camera gimbal. You move yeah. it all, whatever, you know, wherever you want, it stays yeah. the same place, that kind of thing. That's right? right. He's always in a state of unstable equilibrium. That's why he can move so freely. But of course, yeah. if there's any extraneous movement, a big movement is actually going to reduce his freedom because it detracts from his sense of balance. So when he's precisely balanced, he can move, dung, and you don't even see anything external. But actually, uh, Doug Johnson, uh, he's the creator of kinematic integration, uh, from which I got my term piano kinematics. He's a great jazz pianist. Go watch him play online, Doug Johnson. Teaches at Berkeley, and he says that he sees yeah. the kinematic chain in Horowitz. He can see it. His eyes are that good. And he sees, for instance, he says, Kamal's not quite there that he doesn't see the kinematic train going from the foot to the pelvis to the shoulders to the hand the entire thing and he sees it in Horowitz and Kemal's almost there but not quite so it's interesting perception uh, Kemal's actually changed his playing in the last couple of years and I think now maybe he has it too but you see it's an internal thing it's not it's not all this moving kind of stuff that you see pianists doing they're, yeah. de they're detracting from their sense of balance. They're throwing themselves off balance in an attempt to be expressive. So the movement has to be internalized to intensify the artistic effect, the artistic how, result. How would you teach this to a kid? How would you explain elasticity to, to, to a, like a five-year-old? Oh, I do a lot, of, a lot of times I'll just say, let's, let's pretend you're on a trampoline. Doom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba. And we get that, and we... we we can say pretend you're bouncing on a trampoline or we can say pretend your hand is the trampoline and then uh, I don't know if you can see oh the camera can see it then I can put my hand on the edge of a table 
And so, okay, wait a minute, look. Now you can see this. So my fingers are hanging on the end of the table, and then I, my left hand is bouncing on my right hand. My right hand is the trampoline, and my left hand is the person bouncing on the trampoline. So you can very quickly get a sense of elasticity. It's very yeah. different from the, uh, the, the effort of pulling the hand up or stabilizing it. it. The structure remains stable even in its ability to function as a shock absorber, as a trampoline mm -hmm. mat. So that's one way of doing it with kids, for instance. Yeah, good question. Oh shit, we're gonna get go offline. I just might might uh, anyway. Anyway, while he's getting back, I'll I'll continue to talk about Sebastian. Uh, I we got cut off there, but anyway, so so Sebastian, we worked for instance Ravel Sonatine, which is this delicate, difficult little piece, which is ideal for investigating. If you bring any weight to that, it's game over. You have no orchestrations. And so it was an entire uh, uh, ideal operation uh, uh, opportunity to just to investigate this fluttery, seemingly almost no contact touch, where actually the skeletal contact is present in a very sophisticated and subtle way. Interesting. But does yeah. he have like a history of hand injuries, uh, dystonia or something, or or oh, gee, I forget. Why, why did you work with him that way? Uh, well, no, his his artistry needed it. I forget whether he had some pain at some point or not. I really, yeah, I think he had some pain at some point. It's so interesting. So many people come to me with pain problems, and then we resolve the pain problem relatively quickly, and then the same uh, interventions which we would do for artistic purposes are used to solve the pain problem. So then we continue to do them for artistic purposes. And yeah, that, that's yeah. what happened with, the, with this Ravel Sonatine. Mm -hmm. So after Eitorf, I, uh, I flew uh, from Dusseldorf to Washington via Istanbul. So I was like 20 hours in the, in, in, on the route. <laughs> it was quite a trip. And spent Easter at Washington National Cathedral. It was amazing. Uh, the music was totally amazing. And that, the, 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 the cathedral is unbelievable. A, a new Gothic cathedral with one of the windows it's this amazing sort of space age window, and in the middle of the, the center panel is this little black thing with rays streaming out from it in the stained glass. And the little black thing is a moon rock. It's a piece oh, wow. of the moon, the moon? Awesome. in Washington National <laughs> Cathedral. It's like right. Unbelievable, yeah. Cool. Nice. And then started this two weeks with, with Marjorie Lee, who is uh, a blessing and worth her weight in gold. and. Uh, I worked with many of her students and she arranged for me to present at several of the, the DC area universities and music teachers associations. And we just, uh, the, the, the question was, okay, it looks like this way of working is pretty effective. Like it gets a lot of people out of a lot of problems that they've had. But then there's this skepticism from the mainstream community. So how to overcome skepticism. You, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So yeah. you can't force people to change their minds. It, there ha the information has to be presented in such a way that, that the potential value of it is perceived. So yeah. this is why I spoke at, at the Music Teachers Association's meetings more and more about arm weight as a positive thing but the anti-gravity mechanism as the thing which makes arm weight work. Yeah. yeah. In other words, yeah. okay, feel the weight of your arm, but bring yourself to the point of unstable equilibrium every time. Just as in walking, I do have weight, you know, I weigh 200 pounds or more. <clears throat> but uh, when I stand up, I don't feel that weight. I feel my skeleton unfolding and there I am balanced. Mm -hmm. And just the simple manifestation of that, you know, in the hand, already cha changes everything. So, and then, you know, how does the thumb work, you know, especially you know, uh, different from the other fingers? How does the arm function like a torso? And artistics, go, you know, following a phrase is exactly the same as the ballet dancer's torso not going like this every time he takes a step. And so mapping on the physical functions to the musical functions. And the amazing thing about this approach is that that mapping is always total. 
Yeah, yeah. and how did you, how did you, how did people react to it? Like, I, I watched the, is it M, 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 C, M, T, A talk? That's I right. Think. Mm -hmm. And how, how did, what, what did the people say afterwards to you? I think um, they were excited about it. Yeah, people were, you know, you see, you see a few skeptical faces in the audience and you see a few sort of, you didn't get it. um, reticent, like. And then you yeah. see, see, so you see, sort of a little bit of curiosity coming, and some heads nodding, and then you get the opposite question, which shows that people are actually with you and on, on you know, sort of going through this, this uh, investigative logical progression. So it's hard to say. I felt that that uh, I, it was well received, uh, and I had several really interesting conversations with people after each of these talks. Right. And yeah. some of them came for lessons after that, so so it seems like there is some interest. Um, you know, it's, it's I feel nobody's presenting this information the way you do. Like everybody, mm -hmm. nobody's nobody's saying things the way you are saying, and nobody's presenting this information. And it's hard to convey all all of these all this research. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult question. I mean, the, the reason nobody else is doing it because nobody else had the amazing luck I had to have four right. great mentors who all yes. brought me in this direction in one way or another. So, um, uh, you know, I sort of, I used to suffer more from voice in the wilderness syndrome. Like, oh my God, why don't people understand me more? But now it's, right. just, it's like you realize, that, you know, we, we were all brought up in this steady diet, this tradition the arm weight tradition amongst other things and this information is very new so it's it's not easy to to change gears and to start thinking this way uh, and many times it's you can't teach an old dog new tricks uh, many times it's simply I don't know I'm, st I'm still looking for the way to explain it where it's easily graspable and, you know, things that seem normal to me because I've done 20 years of Feldenkrais are just like complete moon talk to somebody who's never done Feldenkrais and doesn't know what it is. Sure. So it's it's a difficult it's a difficult uh, project, but of course all you can do is keep trying and keep experimenting and keep responding to to how people interact and then you know tweak your presentation. Uh, so you can see that in the talks, even through the, the five Washington talks that I sent you, uh, that there, there was a development in just how I spoke about, about the issues. But uh, some of the lessons were amazing. I mean, I had a Rachmaninoff second concerto that uh, went, once we brought the elasticity to the hand, not just standing up, but standing up elastically. His, mm -hmm. his sound went, this is Eric Lynn, who, who's won several competitions there, went fantastic pianist. And his sound just cool. went through the, the roof. I mean, it, it was excellent to start with, and then it was just mind blowing afterwards. So yes. it was so encour exciting and encouraging to see him really get it and take the ball and run with it. And there were there were many. Uh, I don't know if you've managed to look at some of the group classes where where I worked like with five kids, and we only have an hour and fifteen minutes, so fifteen minutes for each kid, and a little mm -hmm. presentation. And I'm falling down on the floor to make them laugh, to explain how you can relax too much and stuff like that. And coming up with new ways of explaining it on the spot because you know, the kids have such interesting questions. And then you, so that, that for me is, is fascinating, you know, uh, to, to you know, come up with new ways on the spot just because of what the kid's bringing to you. And a kid's mind is such an amazingly open universe and a, unknown universe so each time there's this moment of oh oh i get it there's, here's where this kid is at and let's talk about it like this so several of of those group lessons are uh, quite exciting for me just to, mm -hmm. to see you know the unusual places i can go when i'm kind of challenged like okay what are you going to do with this person yeah. it's always always very exciting so uh, because of washington uh being so successful i decided to add an institute there to my summer schedule. So I'm now going to be in Washington from July 6th to July 10th at the Jordan Kitts Music on uh, uh, Lee Highway. And uh, so the website is, the page is up and you can go and register there if you want or ask questions about it. I'm noticing that nobody's registered. I've sent a whole bunch of emails out. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm thinking. And that's on alanfraserinstitute.com. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, uh, I need to point I'm, out, and I'll put that in the description Fra- as well. Yeah, alanfraserinstitute.com. But I'm yeah. thinking that probably most of the people that had lessons with me there had single lessons. And, like, I put it online as a four-day uh, institute or five-day, I forget. And maybe people are not so sure about doing five lessons in a row. So I might restructure that to make it more like individual lessons plus uh, Feldenkrais and, and oh, yeah. piano okay. lecture. Yeah. But maybe more will sign up as, as, mm-hmm. as we go along. Uh, the, just a month ago. Yeah. Or, the the other time. change in the Summer Institute schedule is that Ottawa has been moved to Toronto. Like okay. I, I had no registrations in Ottawa. There were a few uh, Toronto people, including some Dalcros people. Uh, mm-hmm. And as you know, Charles Ashbender was a Dalcros teacher. Yeah, yeah, uh, and they're sort of interested. So it, it's, it's turning into a really exciting event. I'm going to have only three days in Toronto, but the mornings and early afternoon at University of Toronto with University of Toronto students and staff. And then in the evening at Laura Ono's piano studio, uh, where I'll be teaching. Uh, everybody else because the U of T is a closed session only open to U of T people. Uh, so that's that's really exciting because uh, I'll, I'll be seeing a bunch of new people and again it's this first contact will I succeed in explaining things in a way where where it's immediately useful to people like I don't like my institutes to be like a blip on the screen you go oh I help you play better and then you go home and you continue to play like you did before that's not the point. Yeah. The point is to have ongoing information which can help you develop and put your technique on a firmer footing, a more functional footing, shall we say. Yeah. 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 So uh, th- since Washington, I've, I've taught in Paris for a week. In Paris, it was very difficult because uh, the day after I got there, Phil Cohen died. And, uh, well, it hit me pretty hard. I was, uh, I was surprised because it, I was, we were expecting it. He's, he was old and frail, and, but still, when he left, it was uh, well. It was a special week. It was, uh, it was as if his spirit was with us in that institute. And again, I, I started teaching differently somehow. I can't even explain to you how, uh, but somehow, occasionally. Uh, we had a, a Feldenkrais practitioner come, uh, who's not a pianist, but she wanted to n- know more about working with pianists. And uh, and her student, and Beyond, who is a pianist, uh, got out of uh, this uh, arm weight problem with the tendonitis problem for two years, just with the help of this Feldenkrais practitioner. Mm-hmm. And then, when she got to me, then I could show her the specific ways which the ideas apply in piano to not only relieve her of the remaining pain problems, there was still some pain, but also to just open her sound. And that, oh, wow. that was, uh, again, how the, the thing that's going to help the pain problem and the thing that's going to open your artistry, how they go together. So if you What's look... What's the name of that guy? Anne. Anne Billon. Oh. Okay. And it, if you look at her last lesson at the Paris thing, she plays Schumann, she plays Traumerei, and like, we were all in tears, I mean, because she okay. played it, and it was so interesting, because the first time she played, she played, I think, all of, of uh, Kinderzainen, but we didn't have a chance to work every piece, but we worked the first okay. seven. And like, that when she started, it was a standard kind of, you see this, uh, this kind of, this kind of, this really arm artistic key. teach w- yeah. technique which is actually digging into the key and then needing to release yeah. the arm so it's yeah. very and it's so it's sort of artistically and expressively good to a certain point but limit ultimately limited and then you see uh, her face is like this ar- artistic kind of face which i don't like but i didn't say anything to her about it because she's a very fine artist and i didn't want to criticize everything and then we started working and okay unstable equilibrium do not lose your balance and then get it back just stay here m- manipulate the key without digging into the key and 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 the sound it became like horowitz's sound there was this blossoming and this individual this singing line that was like a thread of expression and expression was there as a force without being forced and the, mm-hmm. And uh, it, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. 
and her face. Yeah, you, know, you, talk, you talk a lot about expression lately. Yeah, but her face was like a mask. Uh -huh. No more uh -huh. of this trying to express. Her face was just there. She was right. totally present, totally in the process of marrying herself to that melodic thread, which is like a spider's web. Okay. And that's where Schumann's expression is. That's where, uh, it, I mean, it, it, was very, it was a very profound moment. It was really something, you should really look at that lesson. <laughs> I will, yeah. Um, I'll try to publish it, yeah. And then, after that, was Loisden with uh, oh, yeah. my dear friend, uh, Fritz Kruse, who you know well. And, yeah. uh, and Fritz uh, is no longer taking lessons from me because he's really, you know, He's, un, you know, we, we, we understood so much that we're talking now like colleagues. So we actually, we had some time before the Institute started and sat at the piano and he played something for me, I played something for him. And he's saying, Alan, you know, you, you could really use a little bit more of the curling the fingertipping. And, you know, I'm always like, don't curl the fingertips too much because it's going to collapse your arch. And he's like, well, yeah, but, and Kemal also told me that you, you must curl the fingertip, but you must hook the fingertip in. He says, Kemal says, yeah. that's where I get my sheen. That's where I get, uh, like, CI, like this laser, yeah. in, like, intensity to the sound. And Bach mm -hmm. said, look, the fingertip, that's your point of contact. That's where, actually where everything happens, in a way. Yeah. So, like... And uh, so then I showed Fritz how, okay, Fritz, you're hooking in, but you're losing a certain degree of structurality here between thumb and second. So right. he, he opened that thumb and second space up. It went through the roof. He started playing like no anomaly anywhere, no contradiction anywhere, just artistry. Just, it was so great. he wasn't weakening the arch. No, so I got him to do it without weakening the arch. Without weakening the arch. And then he yeah, got yeah. me to do it a little more because I was trying so much not to weaken my arch that I wasn't hooking quite enough. And then he got me to the point where I was, okay, now that's it, you're right. You know? So we had this wonderful exchange. But then there were several other people who played. Luba played very well. And Ramon had these amazing lessons where we, we investigated the torso organization and inner movement rather than external movement and sensing things from inside and allowing them to move instead of imposing the movement, even if it's the right movement. Yeah. Mind-blowing lessons. And then, right. and then Karolinka Debray, who is another person who, and this is, I wanted to talk about this. This is, uh, this arm weight technique, uh, I think there are certain artists who are really sensitive. And uh, Katya is another one, uh, Mauro, who played in a completely natural way as a kid. And Karolinka, she showed me how she played as a kid. Little Kramer etudes, churning etudes, but like amazing speed, amazing articulation, lightness, clarity, everything. And then, so she, she had a real gift. And she went off to England and got, came in contact with the Armway School, and it just destroyed her. They kept telling her to wait her touch. It made, her, it, made it impossible for her to play. Uh, her teacher told her, oh, you're, you're going to be the top of my class. I'm going to send you the competitions. You're a great talent. And then it kept not happening. And the teacher didn't realize she's ruining her student with this Armway technique because Carolina is too sensitive to be able to put up with that crap. And so she developed pain, and she de but worst of all, she developed a complete lack of confidence in herself, which is she should be the most confident person in the world about herself, because it's an amazing talent. But she's so sensitive that if you knock it off balance, it's really going to be hurt. So we worked through FI and through uh, piano lessons to, to get her back on track. And already she was at the point where, okay, she can play the way she used to play and free from the arm weight school. And it was, again, it was just like a transformation. It was, uh, well, for me, so gratifying. Cool. Because if, if I can help people, then, then, okay, I didn't do all this for nothing. And it sort of, it makes me realize, oh yeah, this is why I do this. There's actually a really good reason to yeah do all this research and to uh, try to figure out what uh, great piano playing is really all about and what are the ingredients, what are the components of a really masterful technique. Well, 
you have to be in balance. So these last several institutes have uh, broken new ground in that regard. And, uh, well, it's really exciting. Uh, and a part of this, this micro movement, like a lot of the uh, Feldenkrais lessons that, you know, for instance, the side bending lesson, which we do like this, and like this. Well, now I'm doing them like the only the one half of one percent of that movement, like just the very middle of the movement. And when you do it like that, all sorts of internal muscles can let go and change their organization, which would not happen if you do the larger movement. The larger mm. movement gives a different kind of reorganization, but the micro movement one is far more profound, and um, it has to do with the play between agonists and antagonists. You know what that means? No. All muscles, all muscles act in pairs. So if if I'm flexing my finger, then the flexors are the agonists; they are acting, and the antagonists are the extensors. They're putting a break on the movement. They're controlling it and making sure that it's not completely just uncontrolled. Yeah. So now, mm. when I move my finger the other way, now the extensors are the agonists and the flexors are the antagonists. So every time I change direction the antagonist and the agonist switch their roles. So if you just, if you just switch, like just do that much switching degree, uh, now I'm flexing, now I'm extending, now I'm flexing, now I'm extending, all the time, every time I change directions, even like this, the brain has to totally change the muscles. All the agonist muscles have to become antagonist, and now all the antagonist muscles have to become ag agonist muscles. And this constant change is just, there almost there's nothing happening in the musculature. It doesn't have to worry about movement, but it does have to worry about just changing from an agonist role to an antagonist role and changing back. And, then, and this constant change, but with no stress, allows the brain to fine tune that changeover process. And in, in that moment, the muscle transforms. And the muscle becomes more adept at changing gears and the muscle becomes more adept at managing the movement without any extra effort. Mm -hmm. So the movements yeah. become smoother. <laughs> what? No, no. But you, you talk about like uh, uh, making like a what? What did you call? Oh, no, I'm gonna add construction here. Uh, no, you you were talking about like defining a mental image. Yeah. Uh, beforehand, and then yeah. Uh, defining a like, mental image. Like 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 building up a mental image of how you want your your hands uh, to move, and then according and acting according, you know, to that. Oh, thank uh, you. I for, I forgot the most important part. Sure. While I was in Washington D.C., I met Stephen Levin. Oh, cool! Yeah, that's the right. The founder of Biotensegrity. Yeah. He is a great guy. <laughs> Like, the guy is as smart as a cookie. He came to, to one of my workshops and uh, just loved it, watched what I was doing. He says, oh, Alan, that's biotensegrity in action. And what he said is that it's a closed system. So the arm weight system opens the system. It, it, it makes part of you. And what he's saying is that if you are on the space station and you're weightless and you push against the wall then it pushes you away from the wall, and the wall doesn't feel anything, the wall doesn't collapse, the wall doesn't... So the whole system of movement in you stays in you, it stays internal, instead of <clears throat> this externalization, yeah. this compression. And he's saying, so when, when the body is acting in terms of biotensegrity, then it is a closed system, it's a, it's a system in flux. And he saw me with my students cultivating that relationship to the piano key. So we had, uh, the, he's fed me dinner several times as a guy. He's got a lovely wife and, who cooks well, and uh, she's Guatemalan, uh, and, uh, and we, we just, uh, we shot the shit at his place for several hours on a couple of occasions. And uh, it, he, there, he's still developing his ideas on biotensegrity. But, of course, he's, I'm thrilled with what he's doing. He's thrilled to see what I'm doing. So we had this sort of mutual admiration society. But it, I, I had to pick his brain, and it's, it's really... Well, I'm still digesting stuff that I heard. Like, he's saying that, for instance, uh, uh, you know, mat, there are three forms of matter. Solid, uh, solid liquid, liquid, and, and gas. gas. He says there's yeah. more than three. So, okay. for instance, he says there's soft matter. 
So if you take a silly putty and you make it into a ball and you bounce it, it bounces like a ball. That means it's solid. If you now put that silly putty on the table, without changing the temperature of the room, the silly putty will sort of melt. Mm -hmm. So it's not liquid, it's not solid. It's soft matter. Foam, <laughs> foam is another kind of soft matter. He's saying much of the body, perhaps all of the body, is in one way or another soft matter. And all of the body is functioning like silly putty. Silly putty, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. Another, another sort of metaphor or another concept which just wings you and says, oh my God, if that's the case, then what does that mean for playing the piano? And then, you know, we're off and running and we're discovering new ways of talking about what we do. So the oh. whole thing was a hoot. I also, oh, nice. also met Maureen McHugh, who's a, a, a Feldenkrais practitioner. We did our training together 30 years ago. And she gave me some lessons for my neck having to do with extension. I should tell you about this very briefly. These don't seem that related to piano, but they are, okay? So bear with me. Uh, you don't know, older North Americans would know Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Two of the basketball greats from the 1970s. Yes. Wilt, the first one I heard of, the second one. Wilt, Wilt the Stilt, he was like seven feet tall or something. And oh, Bill Russell was six foot six. So that means Bill Russell is 15 centimeters or six inches shorter than Wilt Chamberlain. And at, sure. the, at the tip off, they were both centers. And at the tip off, Bill Russell got every tip off, even though he's six inches shorter. So how did he sure. do it? And you see in the picture, Wilt the Stilt is like this. And Bill Russell is like, watch the extension on my right side. Oh, wow. Did you see that? All the ribs opened up like an accordion. And that comes yeah. right from the ankle. That comes, So the whole side of the body is opening and going into extension. And he got more than six inches extra height because of that and, and beat Wilt the Stilt on the tip off every time. Amazing. She's got a picture where you see it totally. So she's giving me, okay, walk, Alan, walk, and put a little bit of extension. And when you do, for instance, the, the, this side bending, instead of keeping the head in the middle, go on to the left ischion and, is, 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 uh, sits bone, and then get the head above that sits bone. Go on to the right and get the head above that sits bone. And it gives me a little bit more extension. And it does very nice things for my upper spine. So uh, Maureen and I had several interactions, exchanges, and she came and watched some of my workshops. And she's going to be working with some of the Washington students who, whom, I, cool. whom I taught in an ongoing way because she's in Arlington. So the Washington uh, experience was, was memorable for those uh, contacts, for those meetings with really remarkable people, uh, as, as well as you know, the lessons that were taught and the presentations that were given. So, given that, in 10 days, I'm, I'm off to, I fly into Boston, and I'm spending a day with Doug Johnson before I go up to Concord, New Hampshire. The, the first institute, Concord, New Hampshire, is like completely empty, nobody registered. So I'll teach a few of the local people and, and have some time to relax. Then Amherst, Massachusetts is full, and it's going to be a very exciting institute. And then I go to Montreal for my Tai Chi intensive weekend with Sam Slutsky, and then to Toronto for a three-day institute. If you're anywhere in the area, look online. There's it's the AlanFraserInstitute.com slash Toronto. Then who's next? Then Washington, yeah. D.C. I squeezed Washington, D.C. in between Toronto and Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is is half full, I think. And, yeah. then, and then, then you go back to Washington in September, right? End, end, of, end of September, of September uh, I'm giving a presentation at the Feldenkrais Guild Annual Conference, which is in Washington this year. And uh, after that, present, the, the presentation is on the Saturday, September 29th. And after that, I'll be doing a five-day workshop in Washington as well. Oh. And then nice. we're planning, uh, this is not confirmed yet, but planning an event in New York City. Oh, wow. So if anybody's interested in, the, in that event, please send us an email so we can know in advance and keep you mm -hmm. in the loop. Uh, New York City, my brother Scott is going to organize something. So it's going to be for Feldenkrais practitioners and for pianists and for other musicians. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because yeah. the, the last thing I did in Washington was a, a, a Feldenkrais presentation where only one or two 
of the people were, were pianists and all the rest were singers, violoncello, violin, uh, uh, oboe or recorder or something, guitar, folk guitarist. And it was Feldenkrais to open up their performance, to open up their sound, to get rid of, of pain problems in all of these different instrumental contexts. I should publish that. I should put that in a free section on Feldenkrais. Yeah, that would be very yeah. good, except it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I forgot my camera, so parts of it were filmed with telephones and parts of it were not filmed. Yeah. But I can get you if you remind me. Yeah. I, yeah it's, it, some of it is somewhere on my computer. I can send those okay. things to you. I haven't done it yet. Yeah. You have regrettable. Yeah, I just good. left my camera. I don't know how I did that. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's really cool because lots. I, I get a lot of questions from other musicians, mm -hmm. and 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 the stuff you talk about, of course, applies to them. But they're they're mostly interested in in Feldenkrais stuff. Yeah, but this, uh, but is Feldenkrais applied to musical performance and the yeah. specific yeah. ways that a musical performer uses his body, exactly. his or her body? They're, they're, it's it's uh, it's astonishing the 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 illusions or the wrong thinking that we're all stuck in in terms of stabilizing the body and what you can do to open up your sound, uh, no matter what instrument you're playing, basically, mm -hmm. and reduce yeah. pain. One of the most elegant lessons I've taught in this regard was to a violinist, a high school student. She had wrist pain, and she was hyperextended in her lower spine. And so I got her moving her shoulder blades. I got her moving her shoulder blades. I got her to play the violin by moving the violin and not moving the bow. I got her, we did the, the, the first cardinal direction of movement to get a completely different feeling in her back and more flexibility rather than stuck in this extended position. And we did stuff with the arm where you, we went way further than you would go to put your hand on the violin thing. So that this doesn't seem like an extreme position. All of a sudden it seems like your midpoint. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I never touched her wrist. I never went anywhere near her wrist. And all mm -hmm. the wrist pain went away. Wow. Yeah, so that, that's what Feldenkrais called an elegant lesson. That's an, a lesson where the elegance of the system comes into play and you realize that it, everything is related systemically so when you regulate the whole system any anomaly within the system will tend to disappear wow. yeah. Huh. yeah cool I, I never thought about it that way but yeah, yeah. that makes well, sense you see you, you've been with me for 10 years and you never thought about it that way so like what am i going to do with somebody who's never heard me from a hole in the wall and you try and present That's these right. new ideas <laughs> you know it's like well, you know, presenting new stuff is pro it's problematic, it's inherent in, it the, in the nature of the game. Yeah. There's no way around it, no way around it. So one thing which would be great would be if everybody who's watching this goes to their piano forum and comments or links to something which is on the free part of the site That'd be great. and yeah. just to, yeah. to, to expand the conversation because really... Uh, these ideas are going to help more people the more the conversation is expanded into other areas. So that's something yeah, I've sure. thought about for a long time. We, we keep forgetting to say it, but the, many of you are members of a piano forum or something. And are you talking about your experiences with these ideas on your piano forum? You should be. Not because I'm desperate for money, <laughs> but because... I, I'm so excited about these ideas, and it's so great when, you know, I have a student in Sweden named Ingela, and uh, she's amateur pianist, she's now retired, and she's, she's, she came to me, she did not play very well. And we've been working only on Kramer A2s the last few lessons, oh. online, on Skype, and she's starting to go like, that's not possible. That's not possible because she was going, doo, 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 you know, but we, we had to figure out a way to get her out of that clunky sort of touch. And it's a combination of the physical perception and the oral perception. It's marrying the ear to the hand, marrying the ear to the finger, and then working in rhythmic ways, working in little chunks, chaining, da little dum, da little little dum, chaining groups of small groups of notes, and then just getting a completely new feeling going. And she's like, huh? This is unbelievable. How am I doing this? It's almost like schizophrenic. Like, well, my God, that's not me. 
because it's not. A, but you know, this this stuff can help anybody. <laughs> It's, it's so yeah. amazing when you take the weight out of the equation yeah. or you put the weight, uh, or rather you, when you balance the weight and make it only one side of the equation and have all the balancing elements in place, then, bam, it doesn't just improve, it transforms, it goes. Yeah. It's like a rock. A kitty craft. Oh, yeah. Well, while I was in Washington, Marjorie's husband, Ken Lee, is a very fine clarinet clarinetist and clarinet professor. He's one of the top teachers in the area. And he's friends with Chuck, Chuck, what's Chuck's last name? Another clarinetist who publishes books with uh, a subsidiary of Hal Leonard. And we had dinner. And we're discussing this thing, how best to present these ideas, how to communicate these ideas to a wider audience. And as we talked about this book, that book, my fifth book, my fourth book, which was rejected recently by Oxford University Press, I have to... I have to call Scarecrow, call Scarecrow, hold on a second. They, su they suggested that probably uh, Kitty Craft is the best vehicle to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to present my work to a wider audience. So I'm now, uh, I'm now editing Kitty Craft uh, in quite, quite extensively. Okay. So the, Kitty Craft, the version of Kitty Craft which is now online is already getting kind of out of date because it's going to look a little bit different by the time it gets to publication. Uh, however, it's still, uh, you know, you still have time if you want to write me uh, anything at all about your experiences using Kitty Craft with your kids or with yourself, what works, what doesn't work, and perhaps I've already made some changes in the lesson, which, you, but, which you're going to suggest, but perhaps not. Perhaps you can help me out in making that book a better book. So my, the, the project is now to, to get a, a working version of Kitty Craft up and running and to present it to Hal Leonard. And uh, we'll see if we can, and if that works, then eventually there will be a method book to go with it where I'm gonna write small compositions for kids for each Kitty Craft exercise. Oh man, yeah. I can't, well, that'd be yeah. so cool because I can make yeah. an interactive section of the site with like yeah. corresponding videos and text comments, yeah what we're going to uh, do when that section. when that version of kitcraft is done then uh there's going to be a section of, of the site where oh, we're yeah. going to upgrade those informal talks those informal demonstrations that i did yeah. and i'm yeah. going to do something a little more formal with two or three cameras in my uh novi side studio with the nice. steinway and and actually make that uh oh. interactive with the book so that's, that's a long-term cool. project, but that's that's in the cards. And unfortunately, um, play the piano with your whole self, which is basically done. Is uh, we don't have a publisher yet, and I'm not quite ready yet to give up and self-publish again. So uh, one person paid, and uh, and then finally, what we did, we said, I said to it, listen, you know. The, our deal fell through. Would you like to, me to give you a 50% refund and send you the PDF file of the book manuscript. Oh, and okay. the manuscript? And so that's what I did. So there, there is a, a copy of Play the Piano with Your Whole Self out in the real world with one of this group who, uh, who has a, a manuscript copy. And I'm actually willing to do that with anybody who's interested because I think it's yeah, a, it, there's a... Yeah, put it up a, on, a, on the store. That, that's easy. Yeah, so for now it's a it's going to be a PDF version of of uh, that book, but I think we should do that as a way to get get that information, uh, especially now that Phil has died. This is basically my homage to Phil Cohen and my deepest yeah. effort yet to communicate his work to a, a wider audience. So I think it, it you know every you know every month that we wait is a is a month lost in a way.